starts, stops, and side effects. Revisiting what we know about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine on this episode of Shareable Science, Beyond the Blog. Welcome to Shareable Science. Science you can share. Let's talk about what we know about the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine and the pause and the restart. Let's begin with the timeline. So the vaccine was first given emergency use authorization at the end of February. And then on the 13th of April, the CDC and the FDA recommended pausing vaccination because at that point they had received data about six women that developed a really rare but serious set of side effects. And so they made the recommendation to pause vaccination at that point while a group could assemble and review the data and then make decisions about going forward. So the data was reviewed by the ACIP, that's the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, and other working groups. They met multiple times during this 10-day window, reviewed the data, and on the 23rd of April made the recommendation to lift the pause and add a warning about this rare but serious side effect. And the CDC and FDA approved that lift and people began getting vaccinated again. That's the headline. Let's go deeper into the science. So the specific side effect now actually has a name. Here it is, thrombosis with thrombocytopenia, TTS. That's a mouthful, but here's what that means. Thrombosis, these are blood clots. These are fairly large blood clots in large uh, vessels, uh, arteries and veins, many of them in the brain, but also in the legs and in um, the abdomen as well. And then thrombocytopenia, that's, this is a really low level of platelets. So uh, clots, but also a lack of some of the systems that provide clotting. So these things don't normally, you wouldn't think they normally go together, but we've seen them in other rare syndromes. And we've also seen this with the AstraZeneca vaccine in Europe and in other parts of the world. Here's the data that we have. This is the data that the advisory committee looked at. So it's as of the 21st of April. By that point, there had been nearly 8 million doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine delivered, and about half of those went to women. And that's important because nearly all of these cases were identified in women. In fact, there were 15 cases in this batch that were identified, and they were all women. There was one case from the clinical trials of this strange clotting disorder that happened to actually be identified in a man. So this is very heavily geared towards something that is happening in women, but not exclusively. So 15 cases out of seven, almost 8 million, 15 cases out of 4 million doses for women. That's a small number, so this is really rare, but it is serious, which is why everything paused to look at the data. You can actually look at the different age groups of the individuals that were vaccinated and you can determine per million cases of vaccination in those age group, what were the frequencies of seeing TTS. Here's that data. Women age 18 to 49, you saw seven cases for every million doses given to this audience. A higher percentage for women 30 to 39. This is actually the category where you saw the highest frequency of cases in that younger women category. Women over the age of 50 and men of any age, much, much lower, less than one case per million. So number one, you're talking about something that primarily happens in women and that seems to happen specifically in younger women. This seems to be some sort of an immune response, an immune reaction to something in the vaccine. We don't have that level of science yet. So we have to wait to gather more data to truly be able to say, here's what that trigger is. But this is definitely a rare but serious side effect from the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. You can dig deeper into that data at this reference here, or you can actually go to the show notes for this video and you can see the PDF with all of the references for today's episode. Now, this group, the Advisory Council, also ran what's called a risk-benefit analysis. And a risk-benefit analysis is a set of modeling, it's predictions, saying if we continue vaccination under a certain set of conditions, 
what do we expect the benefits of that vaccination would be and what are the risks for this TTS syndrome? So they made some assumptions. They did their modeling for the next six months. So the, uh, the end of April through the end of October, they assumed that there would be only a 50% vaccination rate for Johnson & Johnson. So in other words, because of vaccine hesitancy or concern about the vaccine, the rate of people getting vaccinated from Johnson & Johnson would be cut in half. And they also made an assumption that over the next six months, the level of virus transmission was low. You can see a different set of models with different assumptions like higher virus transmission by going to that reference I showed you at the bottom of the previous, uh, previous whiteboard. But here's what this set of assumptions tells you for this risk benefit. That would mean about almost 10 million new vaccinations across the United States. And over the next six months, that would result in a nearly 4,000 person drop in hospitalizations, dropping admissions to the intensive care unit by almost 1,000, and reducing deaths by 586. Those are the benefits of continuing and offering this to all adults. Um, age 18 and up. You also would expect under those conditions that you would see 26 new cases of TTS. So a small number, but not insignificant. Fortunately, physicians now know specifically how to treat this, this rare syndrome. You use a different type of anticoagulant. You don't use heparin, you use something completely different, but now that medical care is known. So given all this information, the advisory committee made the recommendation to move forward, to restart vaccination, and to add a warning both for physicians and for especially younger women about this rare but serious side effect and the risks of that. So this is what they say you should be watching for if you get the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and you need to watch for any of these symptoms within the three-week window of getting vaccinated. A couple more points. As I said earlier, this is similar to the kind of symptoms that you see in Europe with the AstraZeneca vaccine. And Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca, their vaccine is built in the same way. It uses an adenovirus to carry the genetic code for the spike protein. So it may be that this is a rare side effect of adenovirus-based vaccines. We'll have to wait and see and gather more information. You don't see this set of side effects with the mRNA vaccines. So there's no evidence of this with the Pfizer or with the Moderna vaccines. And that brings me to my last point. Here in America, most of us have the opportunity to choose from a range of vaccines. I recognize that's not true for everyone, but many of us are at the point now where we can decide if we want to get an mRNA vaccine or the Johnson & Johnson. And I think this data is useful to people making that decision. For example, a man or a woman over the age of 50 may decide that the risk is so small and the advantage of a one-dose vaccine is so strong that they would take the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Women under the age of 50, especially women in their 30s, may look at this data and decide that they would rather look at an mRNA vaccine over the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Again, the benefits overall outweigh the risks, but these are serious risks for a small number of individuals. That's why I wanted us to go deeper into the data so that you could see behind the headline and use that to help make choices. Please share this video with other people who might be thinking about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine or who have already taken the Johnson & Johnson vaccine and have questions. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you again on the next episode of Shareable Science Beyond the Blog. Take care.